Wittgenstein, perhaps the most influential 20th century philosopher of language. He was born in 1889 in Austria-Hungary, studied mechanical engineering in Berlin in 1906, worked on aeronautics research in Manchester in 08, before becoming obsessed with formal logic and the philosophy of science. Before serving in the Austro-Hungarian army in World War I, he would spend time amongst some of the most hard-nosed figures of English-speaking philosophy. Speaking of his pre-war meetings with the famous Frege, He absolutely wiped the floor with me, and I felt very depressed, but at the end he said you must come again, so I cheered up. I had several discussions with him after that. Frege would never talk about anything but logic and mathematics, if I started on some other subject, he would say something polite and then plunge back into logic and mathematics. In such an environment, he came to the following summary. Philosophy is, all those primitive propositions which are assumed as true without proof by the various sciences. So what makes Wittgenstein so interesting? Two reasons. Immediately following World War I, he had much success in providing the most no-nonsense theory of language in human history. He would then do a complete 180, becoming the most erudite and common-sense critic of his own early work. I'm going to sketch for you the early Wittgenstein, and then the latter Wittgenstein. Hopefully you can glean something from their differences. In 1922, Wittgenstein published the Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, and if that's not a pompous name that screams listen philosophy, I've got you all figured out, then its contents certainly are. The Tractatus is a theory of the declarative sentence, and of the relationship between that sentence and reality. Here is the entirety of chapter 1. Notice the way it is laid out. Propositions are numbered. Where one logically entails another, they are subnumbered. This system mirrors Wittgenstein's approach to philosophy in general. The project of the Tractatus is to start with as few and as uncontroversial propositions as possible, and logically enumerate any and all aspects of human communication on top of them. Quite the grand project. In service to this goal, he breaks down propositions into three categories. They can be true, they can be false, and they can be nonsense. If separating true from false is the job of science, then separating sense from nonsense is the job of philosophy. Wittgenstein will have succeeded if he can provide tools to identify nonsense wherever it appears. I will not take you through the text, but I will sketch it. He starts with Proposition 1, the world is everything that is the case. This is already hugely contentious among scholars of Wittgenstein, but my preferred take is that he is trying to tie truth to this world and this world to truth. We're not going to talk about other dimensions, or souls, or any other metaphysics that would otherwise blur the line between sense and nonsense. If it's the case, then it's part of the world. If it's part of the world, then it's the case. Since we're only interested in the world, everything we think and everything we say should pertain to things that are the case, things that are true. If we don't know if something is true, we refer to science by putting it in a proposition. The cat is on the mat is true if the cat is indeed on the mat. 1 plus 1 equals 2 is always true because of how those symbols are defined. A proposition is nonsensical if its truth value cannot be found. The cat has a round soul, or the chair belongs to the platonic form of chairness, are examples. With this tool, he is able to dismiss a lot. In chapter 4, he proclaims, Most of the propositions and questions to be found in philosophical works are not false but nonsensical. Consequently we cannot give any answer to questions of this kind, but can only point out that they are nonsensical. Most of the propositions and questions of philosophers arise from our failure to understand the logic of our language. They belong to the same class as the question whether the good is more or less ideal than the beautiful, and it is not surprising that the deepest problems are in fact not problems at all. In chapter 6, he derives a general form for the truth function for all sense-making propositions. I will not attempt to explain it, but I will highlight a distinction that will become important later. 
there are two kinds of things that are true. The first kind, analytic truth, is uninteresting to the author of the Tractatus. It consists of things that are always true by definition. 1 plus 1 equals 2, all bachelors are unmarried, etc. The second kind, synthetic truths, are true because of the way the world is. The cat happens to be on the mat, you happen to be listening to me, etc. These are referred to in the Tractatus as atomic truths. Wittgenstein comes out of this work truly believing he has solved philosophy, because philosophy is a collection of propositions, and he has just forwarded a theory that either labels such propositions as nonsense, or provides tools to solve for their truth value. The work caused a stir in hard-nosed analytical philosophy circles. Finally, someone has had a real breakthrough. His work got him a fellowship at Cambridge in 1929, and eventually the Chair of Philosophy in 1939, whereupon he was very quickly made a British subject. But Wittgenstein became more and more uneasy as time went on. Were they so sure he was right? Are you sure about that? Were his conclusions truly inescapable? Wittgenstein, the most logically exhaustive philosopher of his generation, would soon come to denounce his own conclusions. He refused to publish after the Tractatus, deciding that it felt too final. The second of his two great works, The Philosophical Investigations, would be posthumously published in 1953. The character of this work is very different than that of the Tractatus. In the preface, Wittgenstein effectively writes that he would have written a good book if he could, but unfortunately this is all he can manage. Despite his newfound modesty, the Investigations is sensational, causing analytical schools to doubt their similar doctrines, and all the while forwarding entirely novel and refreshingly common sense ideas on the relationship between language and the world. In the Tractatus, Propositions were thought to convey a picture. You are listening to me is a synthetic proposition that describes a true picture of what you are doing. In the investigations, propositions are part of broader rubrics Wittgenstein calls language games. So, I'm speaking to you right now is part of the example to explain a concept game, which is different from how I might later describe this on a phone call with my mother where we would be playing the Describing Our Day as a Tool to Keep in Touch game. This difference has many consequences, but I will talk about how language games function without necessarily appealing to science or logic. The Describing My Day as a Tool to Keep in Touch game does not have the same rules as the Reconstructing a Crime Scene game. In fact, Wittgenstein supposes there are no through lines you can make that cover all possible language games. The reconstructing this experience lyrically to write a country song about it game is completely unconcerned with whether or not what it's saying is true, except perhaps where it seeks to make commentary on those very things. Now, to be fair, the other analytical philosophers have tools to dismiss this theory. They would say, this conception leads to ambiguity, he paraphrases his old buddy Frege, with whom he once had so much agreement. A concept without a rigid definition is like an unbounded area in geometry. In other words, if you don't have the tools to determine if I'm playing the making a joke game, or the showing you where things are game, then when I say, there's another chair in the lounge room, hearing that statement doesn't actually add to your knowledge of the world. Therefore, nothing was really communicated. If we don't have the same certainty of characterization when talking about chairs as we do when talking about odd numbers, that is to say, we have an ironclad way of agreeing on what is and isn't a part of that category, then we can't intelligently talk about them at all. Imagine if mathematicians got into the same kind of arguments over whether or not three is an odd number as contrarians do about whether the ocean is a soup. I really like the investigation's response to this criticism. Is it senseless to say, stand roughly there? If I said that to you, would you need me to specify, with polar coordinates, where on the Earth's surface exactly I mean? Of course not, you understand. The latter Wittgenstein is much more concerned with the practical contingencies of language 
than he is with finding a skeleton key with which to describe all of it. When we come across a new category, or indeed a new game, the Investigations asks us not to look for a definition, but to look at its use. I have a rough idea of the kinds of things that chairs are, and so do you. Determining if a doll's house chair is a chair is not about understanding some platonic form of the chair, it's about the language game we're playing. If we're playing dolls and I ask for a chair for Mrs. Nesbitt, then a doll's house chair is a chair. If we're playing the I've entered your home and I'm looking for a place to sit down game, then a doll's house chair is not a chair. Science is not required for communication, and ambiguity is, in the general case, unavoidable. The choice of the term game carries with it some baggage that Wittgenstein embraces. It's one of those classic categories for people to try and develop a universal definition. But Wittgenstein asks, what does chess have in common with the Olympics, have in common with solitaire, have in common with slaps, have in common with peekaboo? Is there really a definition that the logical positivists could come up with? Or is the term as nonsensical as the round soul of the cat? Wittgenstein argues that there is nothing that all games have in common, but the terms still make sense. They all share a family resemblance, a set of overlapping characteristics where no one commonality is universal, and the specific set of commonalities that we are interested in depends on the language game we're playing. To back up his hypothesis, he takes the example of Peekaboo. The interesting thing about Peekaboo for Wittgenstein is that nobody has ever taught how to play it. One does not approach the infant and go, Listen kid, here are the rules of Peekaboo. You better jot this down so that you play the game correctly. No, you just do it. They learn by example. For the latter Wittgenstein, categories are informed by how they are used, and to some extent, how they are learned. When that infant grows up, and you try and teach them what a game is, you don't go, Kid, games are competitive exercises, blah blah blah. You say, a game is a thing like tips or Monopoly, and if you want to determine if they have the right idea, you ask, listen, can you tell me what a game is? And if they say that the desk is a game, or that a breadstick is a game, you know you've got to give them some more examples. And if they say that football is a game, and Uno is a game, and so on, then you will have as good a reason as anybody will ever have to believe that that kid understands what a game is. What a sea change from his breakout work, and what a tribute to common sense. It's so common sense, in fact, some people might be wondering why it's important at all. Well, The Investigations doesn't only challenge the dominant 19th and early 20th century English-speaking philosophy of language, it also challenges ancient and influential epistemology, or philosophy of knowledge. To take an example, readers of the Socratic Dialogues may recognize that they are largely about defining categories in the world the same way that we do mathematics. Socrates wins many arguments by, say, demonstrating that Cephalus doesn't really understand what justice is, just because he can't provide a definition that covers interactions between close family members, and enemies, and the state, and so on, in the way that you could define a right angle in any situation. Wittgenstein would say that Plato, and many others, were unintentionally playing sleight of hand here that he is changing his language game, but sticking to the same words, thereby only confusing his interlocutor and the reader into accepting his point of view. Whether you agree with this assessment or not, quite the grand project. Towards the end of his life, he would provide an alternate summary of philosophy, that philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language.